بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم not only had the task of teaching noble traits of character but also he had the task of showing them in his life so he's an example a role model for us to follow and the Quran says as you know in ala khulqin you have great traits of character someone actually was a Jewish person as Imam Ali salam to describe the Prophet very good person to ask to describe the Prophet so Imam Ali said, before I describe the Prophet, can you describe dunya and all the blessings of God in this world? He said, how can I describe all the blessings of God in this world? Then Imam Ali said, what you ask me is more difficult than describing all the blessings of God in this world. Because God in the Quran says that this world is little and all the pleasure and all the blessings in this world is little. Mata'un qalil. The physical world, the material world is very little. But when it comes to the Prophet's character, God says it's adim, it's great. So in God's calculus, Everything we receive in this world is little, but in the same calculus, the traits of character that the Prophet had were great. So if you cannot describe something which is more little, how do you expect me to describe something which is greater? You understand? Because if I say something or someone is great, it's not that important. When I say something is great, it's based on my measures yeah for example if you ask a child which day was the greatest day for you for example if you ask a child of two years old you see the greatest day was that when he, the child had a nice food yeah so you can make a child feel, feel great by 20 pounds, 30 pounds, and a little love. If you ask a teenager, it costs more. To make a teenager feel very good, and that was a great day, maybe a few hundred pounds. Yeah? But still, you can feel a teenager great, feel great, you know, make them feel great. But if you ask a very wise, experienced philosopher or, you know, for example, theologian who has experience, who is now in his 50s, 60s, what makes a day great for you? Then he thinks of many things. He thinks of humanity. He thinks of, you know, uh, many, many things. So you cannot make him feel happy just by a few hundred pounds. If there is one person suffering in any corner of the world, that day cannot be great. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, based on people, their expectations can be different. When God says something or someone is great, that is in His standard. Not in our standard, not even in the standards of a philosopher. So God says, You have great character. 
and we should know that the prophet didn't start having great character after he became a prophet he had it before and this is why God chose him you know the mission that God gives to people to Moses to Jesus to Abraham to Noah to Muhammad this mission is not like a letter you know I can give a letter to any person and say you know please carry on delivering this message yeah does the person who pass on the letter need to have any qualification no he just has to be reliable yeah, yeah. but if I teach you a deep philosophical thing and say pass it on to the next person you have to understand it first because it's not just a piece of paper. If I say, please pass on this paper to that person who is there, it's easy. You take the paper and pass it on. But if I give you an idea and say, pass it on, you have to absorb it. You have to understand it. You have to grasp it. And if I give you my final message for humanity forever which is the message of shifa healing and rahmah mercy and light which is noor and huda which is guidance and i say deliver this message so you should be able to absorb this and pass this message on it's not just a you know for example a book you say okay i take the book and i pass it on even without understanding or just understanding it literally no you have to be grasping the message because from now on people even for understanding the message they look at you and listen to you you have to explain for them so not only you have to be understanding, you have to be good teacher for this. And also, you have to be very much similar to this message. You know, in the Quran, there are some verses that show how close was the Prophet to the Quran. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, about dhikr we sent you dhikr the reminder then says rasul if you look at the quran dhikr then says rasul which recites yatlu alaykum dhikr means the quran because it says anzalna ilaykum we sent it down it cannot be the prophet because for prophet we cannot use enzal but then after zikran says rasulan it doesn't say zikran wa rasulan so zikran rasula it's either badal or atfa bayan so it means that the quran and the prophet are like two sides of the same coin one is a human being and the other one is knowledge of god wisdom of god So, this is why one of the wives of the Prophet was asked about the Prophet. And she said, Kana khuluquhu al Quran. The Prophet's character was the Quran. So, if you want to understand the Quran, look at the Prophet. If you want to understand the Prophet, look at the Quran. You know, sometimes you have two books very similar. You may don't understand one paragraph from one book. I don't know if you have this experience in uh, Jose. We had many times this experience. For example, uh, in Fiqh, one of the books we use, textbooks, is Sharq al Lum'a at Dimashqiyah by Shahid al Sani. Commentary on the book Lum'a by Shahid Awal. So the first author became martyr, and the yeah. commentator became also martyr. 
So, Shahid Zani also has a book, Masalikul Afham, again on fiqh. So sometimes when we had difficulty understanding what Shahid Zani wrote in Sharhul Lum'a, we used to refer to what he wrote in Masalikul Afham. Because he uses different, you know, expressions and different, you know, explanation. So, the same author, the same creator has different creatures or different gifts for us, different presentations. If you don't understand one, you can refer to the other one. Sometimes if you don't understand the Bible, you can refer to the Quran. Or maybe if you don't understand the Quran, you can refer to previous scriptures because it comes from the same God. But very much so between the message and the messenger. The message and messenger are very much similar to each other. So, Prophet was not only a teacher, he was a person that in his life exemplified the Quran, even before he became the Prophet. And if you study the life of the Prophet before Islam, you will see that the Prophet was known and recognized by all people as honest and truthful. Sadiqul Amin. Can you imagine in a society that pride was coming from money, from number of camels and horses and soldiers and which tribe you belong to? Yeah? This, these were the sources of pride. Al Hakum takathur Okay? The main thing was counting the numbers. How many people you have? Even they started counting how many people you have in the graveyard. Yes, For example, they said, we are 1,000 alive and, for example, 2,000 dead. It means we are 3,000 people. How many are in your tribe? You say we are 800, for example, alive and 200, or I don't know, 500 dead. So then they were calculating. So, even graves were counted. Money, women, business, this type of things were important for them. In that society, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was recognized by a person that never told any lies. Never betrayed. You know, I was thinking, <clears throat> why these two particularly were so much established and everyone knew about it? To the extent that you know, uh, Rasulullah, when wanted to migrate from Mecca to Medina, and this is 13 years after the advent of Islam, 13 years of hardship, 13 years of some Muslim being tortured, some being killed, some had to go to exile to Ethiopia, Habashi. Their properties were confiscated. Very, very difficult time, 13 years in Mecca. Okay? But when the Prophet was migrating from Mecca to Medina, he still had some of the trust of the people of Mecca. And he asked Imam Ali, to deliver these trusts back to the owners and then bring Lady Fatima and his mother to Medina. It's amazing. These people are killing Prophet's followers and torturing them and confiscating the properties. But still, if they want a safe place, if they want someone that would never betray, they know that that is the Prophet. They know, and this is a lesson for us, they know that it's impossible to betray, even by having this excuse that they are killers of us, so we can keep them trust and not give them back. Or they have confiscated our properties, so we don't give them back. No. The Prophet doesn't think like this. This is why he is great. 
So, we become good Muslims. This is a test for us. We can be thinking that we are good Muslims. When the day comes that not only our own people, not only our friends from other faith communities, our enemies would say these are the most honest people. If my Muslim brothers, sisters, or if my Christian friends or neighbors, they say it's not enough. When our enemies say, those who don't want to see us, but they say, these people never betray. We have lots of problems with these people, but we have never heard any lies from them. That's the day that we are good followers of the Prophet. So, I was thinking why these two became so obvious. Of course, he was a very generous person, he was a very modest person, he was a very humble person, but why these two were circulated in the you know, minds of those people more? Sadiq al-Amin. Then I came to two conclusions. One, because for future, because God has planned for future, God knew that for them to trust in this prophet in future, in the year 610, he was born 570, Christian era, yeah? So in the year 610, God knew that he's going to give him a message to deliver to people. What would people need the most to trust him? To know that he is truthful and he is trustworthy. And this is why the prophet in Mecca used to tell them, if I tell you, for example, you know, he went on the mount, I think it was Abu Qubais. He said, if I tell you behind this mount, there is an army of enemies and are coming to conquer Mecca. Do you believe? They said, yes, of course. We never, you know, uh, lost our trust in you. We never, you know, heard any lie from you. So he said, I now warn you about God's punishment if you disobey, if you rebel against his will. Something this like. So, because to trust in him or any prophet requires you to believe in their truthfulness and trustworthiness, so God had prepared the ground for this. So no one, it's amazing, you know, maybe today people have difficulty in finding whether Prophet Muhammad was a prophet or not. Now today maybe people have difficulty because they have not seen the prophet. I wish it was possible for us to see the Prophet <laughs> or if we see true followers of the Prophet. So today, people, yes. I, I was just thinking today, this, uh, because of the, uh, the trustfulness and the honestness, what today do you see that we do wrong to not gain this kind of trust or trustfulness? But yeah, very good question. Uh, I come back to this. If I forget, please remind me. So, today maybe people find it difficult. But people who lived in Mecca and lived for 40 years with the Prophet and also knew his grandfather and you know, ancestors and all up to Ibrahim, Abraham. They don't see anything to doubt the integrity of this person. Okay? So, how you can believe for 40 years that this person is truthful and honest? And also, 13 years after he started, you know, presenting the message of God, still you believe that he is trustworthy. Okay? And still, you doubt him. Now today, forget today. Go to that time. For those people, there was no excuse. Because they could not say we didn't know him. They could not say, you know, once we heard a lie from him, forget ten times. 
Even they cannot say once we heard one lie from him. This is why the Quran says, Jahadu biha wa staykanatha anfusuhum zulman wa qulubman. Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab, they denied God's communications. Why? They were certain. This doesn't apply to people who don't believe in Islam today, or at least to maybe 99% of them today, because they don't know. Or at least they don't have that certainty. It needs research, and of course everyone should do research, but for them this was crystal clear. He was uncle of the Prophet. Abu Lahab was uncle of the Prophet. Can he say, I didn't know the Prophet? Or, I have a bad memory of him lying or betraying. So why all of a sudden, when he says, instead of worshipping idols, believe one in one God, why all of a sudden you don't accept? Because you are attached to idolatry, to worshipping these idols, and this brings you money, this brings you position, this brings you fame. Yeah. So it's not in your favor. But on the other hand, just to see how great is this man, although these people had no excuse, but this man is so kind and merciful that not only at the time of migration from Mecca to Medina, even a few years later in Medina, at the end of the Battle of Uhud, when they had already killed Hamza, and many Muslims, and they broke the teeth of the Prophet, and still he says to God, Allahumma de qawmi, fa'innahum la ya'lamun. Please guide my people, they don't know. If it was me and you, we would say, they know very well. Yeah? You know, sometimes we are speaking you know, five minutes or half an hour with someone, and then we say, it's useless to talk to him anymore, because he knows everything. We lose our patience very quickly. But the Prophet says, still these people don't know. Okay? Because he is Rahmatun lil alamin. He said, Ma Allah has not sent me to curse people. Allah has sent me to be Rahmat, to be mercy for people. So he says, oh, Allah, please guide my people. For me, there are a few things which are very important in this statement. One is that he does not curse even after killing of Hamza and many Muslims and you know injuring him. He does not curse. It's very important. First. Second, he doesn't keep silent. He could have said, okay, I don't curse them and I just... Keep silent. He actually prayed for them. When you pray for your enemies, that's a sign of being a man of God. Okay? A woman of God. He said, please guide them. Then, another thing which is very important is, he doesn't say, Allahumma hdeha ula, Allahumma hdehim. Please guide these people, please guide them. No, he says, please guide my people. Do you see? He is bringing them under his wing. And how Allah is going to not listen to this prayer when a human being brings his killers and enemies under his wing and says, these are my people, then Allah is going to deny them mercy? It's impossible. So these are my people. You are a good follower of the Prophet when you can look at your enemies as your people. Who is a good teacher? Is a good teacher who will divide the class and says, Half of them are my students because they listen to me. Half of them are naughty. They are not my students. I don't bother about them. No. A good student says, all my students are my students. This is my class. 
Whether they are good with me or not, they are listening or not, they are appreciating or not, still I have concern for them. This is my class. When you divide your class, this is not godly. When you divide a nation or humanity and say, these are mine and these are not mine, this is not godly. So say, these are my people. And then he also brings an excuse. <coughs> he doesn't just make a prayer. He brings also an excuse. They don't know. And you see that many of them later became Muslims. Many of them, actually, maybe 90% of them, unless they were killed or died, all people became Muslim later, in a matter of a few years. Because God is not going to reject this prayer which comes from a man who has emptied himself from ego. And he's only concerned about prosperity of people. When you demonstrate to God that you only think about prosperity of his people, then God is not going to. You know, if I come to you, when, for example, your son has insulted me, has injured me, has killed me, if I come to you, and that's your son, you have a bad son, for example, okay? And I say, you know, please forgive him. Are you going to, you know, reject my request? No. Say, my son has killed your people, has injured you, and still you ask me to forgive him. I'm definitely going to forgive him because if you can ask for forgiveness for my bad son, I'm going to forgive. There's no way to let such people down. Okay? So, Rasulullah is a man of such traits of, traits of character. So now we go to your question. Sorry, what was your question? There are different reasons. Of course, there are, mashallah, thanks to God, there are honest people in our community everywhere. But as a whole, I think we have also some problems and we have to acknowledge. Unfortunately, we allow exceptions to truthfulness and trustworthiness. And these exceptions are not Islamic, are not godly. For example, we say, we tell the truth to some people, but some people, we have a bad history with them. They have been telling lies to us. They have been deceiving us. They have been enslaving us. So we can tell them lies. Some of us do this. This is not Islamic. We say, these people, or these countries, you know, have, you know, made us suffer for centuries. They have appointed tyrants and dictators to rule us. They have taken away our resources. So why we should be trustworthy? This is not Islamic. Whatever bad they have done, don't let them harm you by you also copying them. This is the worst thing that your enemy can do. I say always, the worst thing that an enemy can do with you is not to kill you or injure you or imprison you. The worst thing is to make you act like them if they don't have morality. If they kill my morality, that's the worst thing. Not if they kill my body and physical life or injure it or harm it. Enemies should only motivate you to become more virtuous. If you want to defeat enemies, 
Of course, you know, sometimes we have personal enemies, but if it's enemy of religion, enemy of God. Because many times, you know, really people don't have enmity with God, people have enmity with us. But we don't want to say they are enemies of God. No. Many times, it's personal. It can happen to be between a Muslim and non-Muslim, or a Christian and non-Christian, but in reality, it's not between God and them. You understand? So many times, we quickly say, they are enemies of God. Why? Because they disagree with me. This is false. But suppose there are people who are proved to be enemies of God. Okay? Suppose. Don't let them and their enmity to take away from you your moral character. Don't say, now I can tell lies to them. I can betray them. No. Up to the last moment of your life, you have to hold on to your virtues. This is what we see in the prophets, in messengers, in Ahlul Bayt. And you know, I am amazed that when you look at, for example, Karbala, you see Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Up to the last moment, he is holding on to his values. It's easy, you know, to hold on your values when everything is perfect. When you have, you know, job, health, safety, security, respect, and saving in your bank, you have everything. Then to be moral is not difficult. And it's still unfortunately you fail sometimes. But even if you are moral, it's not great. Because everything is perfect. But when you lose your job, and then you are going back home, then to keep a still kind and respectful to people is very difficult. When you are wronged, when your safety and security is taken away, when your children are suffering, when your homes are bombarded, still to remain virtuous is not easy. <laughs> but Imam Hussain gave us this lesson that you can go to the most difficult conditions and you can suffer in one day what people in centuries may happen to them. You know, to lose all your beloved in such brutal way in one day is like compressing the tragedies that may happen. Even, you know, uh, I, please, you know, just think about it. How many years you have lived? 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, whatever. How many tragedies have happened to you in these 40 years, 50 years, 60 years? And how many tragedies happened to Imam Hussein one day? So it means that tragedies of centuries or generations were compressed and given to him in one day. Do you see any weakness in him? Do you see him becoming angry and cursing and killing and not understanding what he did, says or does? Or you see that even on the day of Ashura, he is talking to his enemies so that maybe one more person can be guided. You see his love, you see his patience, you see his remembrance of love, his gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his kindness, his readiness. You know, when you are so much bombarded with problems, you don't understand what to do. But you see, when horror is coming, you don't think, you know, it's easy to forgive for her. If it was maybe any of us, we would not be able to forgive her. You say, now you ask me to forgive you, you have brought all these, you know, tragedies to us. You are the person responsible for my family be here. Now you so easily want to be forgiven. How can I forgive you? If it was me and you, you know, we were not being able to forgive her so easily. But he treats her not just as a criminal who repents. He treats him as a saint. 
This is Hussein. He treats him as a hero. Not a person that with difficulty we can forgive him and say, okay, just you don't go to hell. No. A person that Hussein sees in him a great person. A great hero, a saint. So, this is the significance of akhlaq that you find in the Prophet, in his Ahlul Bayt, in his household, and his true followers. So, if we want to be good Muslim, it's not enough just to pray or fast or go to Mecca for pilgrimage. They are all needed, but the whole point in doing all these things is to make a connection with the Prophet. And by following the rituals that the Prophet described and prescribed, then you be in a position to go deeper and connect your heart to him. Not just remain on the surface and say, okay, I'm praying, I'm fasting. This surface is just to get an entrance to the deeper levels of Iman. Not just, you know, you copy the surface. Like someone, you know, sometimes I use this example. Some people, you know, for example, they want to become doctor. Like children, you see, children very easily become doctors. They buy, for example, a white dress. In our country, you know, doctors have white dress. So they buy a white dress and then they take, you know, some, you know, toys. Like for injection, siri, whatever. And they have become doctor. Why? Because doctors have white dress. Doctors carry these tools. Yes, it's true. Doctors have this white dress and carry it. But this doesn't make you doctor. This is just the surface. You have to get the character of a doctor and also qualifications of a doctor. <laughs> Even people who graduate from medical university still may not be a doctor. Because a doctor is the one who cannot have rest unless the patient is receiving enough care. Even the qualification is not needed. But suppose you don't have qualification, you don't have the character of doctors, and you just put on the dress and carry on the tools and pretend that you are a doctor. This is not making you a doctor. And to be a Muslim is not easier than being a doctor. Just by keeping a beard and, you know, praying and fasting, I don't become a Muslim. I become a Muslim when I submit my heart to God. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ دِينًا مِمَّنْ أَسْلَمَ وَجْحَهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَهُوَ مُحْسَنٌ And you have to do ihsan, you have to do good things. You have to be benevolent. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us in becoming good people, good followers of God and His prophets and messengers. And may God help us to exhibit the noble traits of character that Prophet showed us in his life. Wa akhiru da'wan and alhamdulillah rabbil alamin.